This is ABTV, Animal Bites Television. Take a look at these guys. It's hatching season here at BHB, and it's always one of the coolest times of the year for me. And this is a really cool clutch here. This is actually a caramel corn bred to a Tessera het caramel corn. Now, basically, the caramel is a recessive mutation, and the Tessera is a co-dominant mutation. And this is the gene right here that's showing both of those traits, a caramel Tessera. But there's an extra special thing in this. They were both het for stripe, so take a look at this. This little guy here, whew, these little monkeys get a little bit rough. This is a striped caramel to Sarah. That's three genes in there, two of them being recessive and one of them being codominant. Now that is a beautiful animal and it's a great time to be hatching season at BHB. My name is Brian Bartrek. I'm no zoologist, just a guy with a passion for animals. And that passion often takes me on animal adventures around the world. This week we're at BHB during hatchling snake season. You're watching Snake Bites. There's really no better time of the year when you're a snake breeder than to hatch baby snakes. There's just something so cool to see animals come into the world and get a chance to see them fresh babies. Well, we have a ton of baby colubrids starting to hatch. You guys may remember the show where we pulled almost a thousand colubrid eggs. Well, guess what? When you pull those eggs, they eventually hatch, and that's where we're at right now. So I just want to give you kind of an overview of what we're looking at right now. And gosh, there's just so many beautiful babies here. This is just actually an apricot pueblin to a pueblin clutch, actually two different clutches. So there's just a whole bunch of little feisty monkeys here. <laughs> and I tell you, milk snakes, when they're babies, are pretty feisty little guys. But when they get bigger, they tame out really well, and they're certainly one of the most beautiful snakes out here. This is actually pretty cool right here. This is actually a Castachi corn. Now, Castachi corns are a locality specific corn and they hatch a little bit larger, so they're not quite as small. But there is another clutch in here too, and oftentimes I'll put two different clutches in the same egg box, especially when I know I can tell the difference. And of course, this is a little black motley corn snake. Now, the black motley is a double recessive, both aneurysmic or black corn and motley corn. So it's pretty cool to be hatching some motleys, but those Castachis are really cool because they're nice and big and, and they do really really well now this is another really cool thing here we've got let's see we've got uh Het Phantom Sunkiss, so there's all kinds of potential here doesn't look like we hit any Sunkiss phantoms but we did get now phantom is actually a uh, hypo charcoal so this is actually a charcoal corn here or what they call a type b aneurysmic and then we have a whole bunch of other stuff we also had a butter corn clutch in here so there's some butter corns some normal corns the hypo corns of course would be from the phantom because we we're looking for the you know charcoal phantom so there's hypo corns in here some really pretty little hypos as well and then again some just normal um, corn snakes which are really cool Looks like that's about it here, but wow, that's cool. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just hard to explain when you see all these little baby snakes crawling around, how cool it is. And of course, the work has just begun. Later on, we'll pull these boxes down. We have to set up each one of these snakes in its individual boxes, which can take some, some time for sure. Now, this is pretty interesting here. I want to show you guys. This is actually just a Brooks King clutch, which is a South Florida King snake clutch. Um, but you can see that they're 100% hatched out, and the clutch right next to, it, next to it, which happens to be a scaleless rat snake, isn't hatched yet. Now, what's interesting is some snakes will hatch quicker than others, like uh, Florida Kings, Goin' Eye, um, and, and a handful of other snakes, even like Mandarin rat snakes, typically will hatch in about 45 to 52 days, whereas stuff like these rat snakes typically take about 60 days. And you can see this one right here just started to pip. You see some bubbles coming up. And I love that look when you get a snake that just pips the egg and you see it starting to breathe its first breast, but it hasn't actually came out of the egg. So, so <laughs> look at these little guys. <laughs> little Brooks Kings are funny as heck. They just hatch out with so much energy right off the bat. But just like anything, when they get older, they become very, very docile. This is another example here. This is actually uh, a blood red or a diffused corn snake clutch. And again, next to it is a Brooks King clutch. These are white sided Brooks Kings which is a recessive mutation, instead of looking like a normal Brooks King like this, 
it's actually got this really cool white sided. Now, when these first were produced, a lot of people were calling them licorice brook, brooks because they almost look like black licorice down their back, but uh, but that's what they are. Now, a going eye is another animal, or a blotch king is another animal that hatches really quick compared to, say, corn snakes. And this is actually just a couple snakes here. This is actually a scaleless corn snake, the head scaleless corn snake here. But you can see the entire going eye clutch or blotch king clutch is hatched. And of course, we have albinos and the normal phase here. And these are, of course, hat for albino because it was an albino bred to a head albino. Oop, and I got a scapey here. So one thing when you're opening up snakes, they're, they just start, it's like opening up a can of worms. They'll start running around. Um, this is really cool here. This, oh my God, these things are gonna be gorgeous. Again, we just have some aneuthristic uh, white-sided brook king. But more importantly, we have these gorgeous animals here. These are actually scaleless Texas rats. Now, of course, they don't have scales, so when they hatch on this vermiculite, it's kind of weird. The vermiculite actually sticks to the animal, and um, it's kind of kind of gets dirty and it's hard to. So what we do is we take them and we wash them underwater, get all that vermiculite out before we do it. But uh, as a matter of fact, let me go get a thing of water. I want to just dunk this in there because you guys are going to love the way this thing looks. So check this out, I tell you what, these are some, they're not only scaleless Texas rats, but we've been breeding for like specific color, you know, like kind of polymorphism within them. So we've really been going for these really gorgeous pastels and reds and I mean, this line is so incredible. And just take a look at that once you get that vermiculite off. Oh, that thing in a couple sheds is gonna be ridiculous. And you can take a look, like this one is gonna be that really light pastel-y look that I really love. And then you can see this one here has got that more bluish look to it, which is really gorgeous. Man, I tell you, this line of scaleless Texas rats is ridiculous and I'm super excited about it. And there's a whole clutch of them, that's pretty awesome. Woo! Take a look at this. Oh, actually, take a look real quick. Come here, Dave, just poke right here. I love the way this looks right here. This is that what I was talking about, how a snake is just starting to pip out. We have obviously a couple bad eggs in this clutch. It's just something that happens. Eggs either infertile or they go bad during incubation, but you can see this one's just slitting. It's picking its head out. That's a snow corn snake. And I just love that look. That's probably one of the coolest things I see every single day during the hatch season. You see all those bubbles from this first breath, they're hanging out. But let's talk about the snake clutch here that's really cool, is that this is actually a hypo Pueblin milk snake bred to a, a het hypo. And, uh, and, and what's cool is that, you know, hypo is obviously a recessive mutation, but this is actually a hypo apricot Pueblin milk snake. And look at the little guy, he's such a feisty bugger. He He's so small and he's still like, I'm gonna bite you and eat you. But at this size, you know, they have teeth, but there's no way you can feel anything. So it's it's totally good. And see, look at how feisty he is. He's just like hanging on for dear life. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Again, that's a good sign. I mean, they're healthy, they're vibrant. Obviously, this guy's gonna eat really well for me. And uh, I can't believe it. I mean, he's just hanging on with dear life. But again, it's a recessive mutation. And it's really cool when you get the apricot in there because it really looks really, really beautiful. And as they get bigger, they're even better and better. So it's always cool to hatch hypo pueblins. And <laughs> this guy's still hanging on to my finger even as I'm putting them in the, in the thing. Oh my gosh, what a feisty little bugger that thing is. But so hypo pueblins are really cool. Now this is actually, oh, check this out. Oh, these are some good good ones too. These are mosaic cow kings. It's a cow king, but it's got what we call a mosaic patterning to it. And these are the ones that, that are actually more like a dot dash type of a, a pattern, which is my favorite of the mosaics. So you see a lot of different types of mosaics. Like this would be a more typical mosaic here with that kind of connecting lateral, um, you know, striping whatsoever. But, but I love these little dots on these things. As a matter of fact, sometimes I call them dot cows because they're really cool. And of course, it's just a normal cows other than that and then Pueblo milk snakes. So <laughs> I tell you, man, hatching season is so awesome. Whew, that's a lot of baby snakes hatching. And right after the break, we have tons more to show you. So make sure to stick around. Oh, take a look at this. Now, what happens, like I said, sometimes we have two clutches in a box. So when a corn snake clutch hatches and there's a king snake clutch hatches, a lot of times Lori will immediately separate out the corn snakes. That way, you know, snakes really take about seven to 10 days to absorb their yolk. So very rarely will you see a, a cow king or a brooks king eat another snake when it's in an egg box. But every now and then it happens. So typically Lori will just immediately remove any corn snakes that are in king. As a matter of fact, when we're setting up eggs, I try not to set them up together, but sometimes I make mistakes and when they hatch you got to be careful but this is really cool this is actually a het phantom sun kiss bred to same so that's really really neat but you can take a look at here we have 
see, this is the thing that's crazy about corn snakes is that even when you breed stuff together, you pop out stuff that you don't expect. This is actually a hypo striped corn snake, which is really gorgeous. And then we have some hypos. We have another hypo here, another hypo stripe, just like the first one. And we even have a normal striped corn right here. And of course we have a uh, hypo sun kissed right here. Uh, it's hard to say if we hatched out any hypo sun kissed stripes. It doesn't look like we did. Uh, although here's a phantom. Uh, and what I talked about that earlier, where, oh, you know what, this is actually, this is, this is great right here. This is actually the Phantom Sunkist, which is the animal that you're really shooting for in this clutch. This is like the, the best option here. That's just a really cool animal. And when this gets bigger, it's just gonna be absolutely gorgeous. All right, let's see what we got here. All right, let's see here. Oh, this is actually really cool. That's the leucistic scaleless Texas rat snake right there. So that's a pretty awesome animal, huh? So again, the scaleless is recessive and so is the leucistic, which is basically just lacking all the pigment. Leuco is, is Latin for white. And uh, wow, that thing is cool. As a matter of fact, it has really weird colored eyes. It's almost like a red pigment in the eyes, which is pretty interesting. Wow, that's cool. That's a cool animal right there. And then of course, this is, I mean, I just love these guys. One of my favorite colubrids by far, the Mexican black king snake. And uh, I just love these guys. I mean, just that jet black king snake just makes them unbelievably gorgeous. Let's see, just a nice big old swatch of corn. Oh, look at this though, check this out. We've got some diffused albinos and this is actually, oh yeah, it was a fire. So they call these, they call these fire corn snakes. So it's an albino diffused corn snake. And basically what you have, like this is another great example of a fire corn, is you have that completely patternless, almost like whitish head. And then on their belly, they really have no belly pattern. And as they get older, they turn really bright, kind of orange, just like people call them fires. So, um, so that was pretty cool. I thought it was just an albino corn and we had some surprises, but it actually was a fire corn that we bred. Oh my gosh, take a look at this. I love this clutch right here. And this is, I don't know why I've always loved, I love Cal Kings number one, but we started working this lavender snow project a while ago. And uh, it's just such a cool snake. And um, this is a snow cow right here, which is basically a melanistic albino. Now what's interesting is this is the melanistic cow king here, which is basically, they call them chocolate cow kings sometimes. What's interesting is that you would think that making that an albino because the melanistic kind of is covering the pattern with melanin, that chocolate look. So you would think if you took the chocolate out or the melanin out, you would come up and you just have an albino cow king. But believe it or not, the melanin actually masked the pattern even in albino. So that's why you get this solid pink snake. But we took it one step further and we went to, to lavender to produce the lavender snow cow kings, which are these guys right here, just basically a solid purple snake. Now this one still has some banding on it and they're relatively polymorphic. Some will have a lot of banding, some will be solid purple. What an amazing time of the year for snake breeders. Coming into work and checking all these eggs, each time I open up one of these tubs, I'm really not sure what I'm gonna find. Is there gonna be a brand new mutation? Am I gonna hit all the odds I'm hoping for? Or heck, maybe one day, there'll even be a two-headed snake in here. Again, every snake, no matter how common it is, it's just so awesome to finally see hatch. And this is a really cool combination clutch. There's actually two clutches in here. Both of them are albino tricolors. Of course, the albino Nelson's milk snake, which is really a cool animal. And what's funny about these guys is when they first came out, the colubrid market was booming booming like big, and this was like the most special colubrid out there, and they were selling for $2,000 a piece. A guy named Doug Moody is the one that actually produced them. You know, now they become relatively affordable, and they're in the pet trade for, you know, under $100 in wholesale, even cheaper than that. That's really cool. And again, this is a tricolored milk snake that is from the Central American area, but this guy here is really one of the crown jewels of this box here, and that's an albino Arizona Mountain King Snake. We actually bought the uh, first albino Arizona Mountain King Snakes. They were produced from a guy in St. Louis that believe it or not bought a male Arizona Mountain King Snake from a pet shop and a female from another pet shop. When he put them together, bam, out popped these albinos. What's more interesting is there's actually a hypo gene that is linked to this albino that pops up within the same genetic pool and they're both recessive mutations. But I've always loved albino Arizona mountain king snakes. And I tell you, it's just so awesome to finally hatch some again. And speaking of milk snakes, 
This is pretty cool here. This is kind of one of the bigger milk snakes, of course. This is the Honduran milk snake, but this is a hypomelanistic Honduran milk snake. And what's funny is that the first hypos are really being sold as tangerine dreams from Bill and Kathy Love down in Florida at Glade Terp. And eventually they found out that it was a recessive mutation and not just a really beautiful, beautiful polygenic bred Honduran milk snake. But of course, these guys are bred to produce ghost as well. So what you have here is hypomelanistic, which is lacking a little bit of that melanin. And this is also hypomelanistic, but it's also aneurythristic. So it's lacking that red pigment. So it's really beautiful. And Hondurans hatch out really large. I mean, just take a look at the size of that clutch. I mean, these babies eat fuzzies right off the rip. Oh, let's see what we have in this stack here. They're hatching hard and heavy now. What's interesting is almost every day you have, oh gosh, that's cool. This is a nice clutch of corn snakes. And these are really beautiful as babies here. You basically just have motleys and butters and, and uh, ooh, once you start getting a can of worms, man, they just start going. It becomes difficult to con just contain them, that's for sure. Next thing you know, I'm gonna have baby snakes all over the place. Oh, where are you at? Oh my gosh, I tell you, once this gets going, it becomes almost impossible to keep them in there. Oh, Oh, the cage. See, you get one in and four of them <laughs> come back out. This is really where Lori does a lot better job of this for sure. For now, I'm just going to set this down in a bucket so I don't have to chase it around all over the place and then I'll get it back in there and we'll set all these animals up later today. But this is a really beautiful animal, kind of a newer mutation out there. It's called a lava corn snake, which is a type of um, actually hypomelanism, but it's so different than the normal hypogene. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And they almost have like a little bit of a reddish eye. Definitely when they get bigger, they're much more red than the normal hypocorns. So they're just starting to get combined into a bunch of mutations now. So it's really cool to be hatching lavas so that we can really get them into other things. Again, we have a few genes working with them. I'm trying to get this back in is gonna be a chore. Let's see. Okay, go ahead. Uh, make sure we don't get any heads in there. That's the biggest thing. You don't want to close that up and squish any heads. That's for darn sure. Uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, this is really cool. Now, now this is cool. We've showed you guys Pueblin milk snakes, but these are actually a polygenic Pueblin milk snake. They're called Oreo Pueblins. And basically what we're doing is we're trying to breed out the red. I know it's a little weird because milk snakes are red, black, and yellow, and the red makes them really beautiful. But what we're trying to do is actually get them to a point where they don't have red on them so that they're just as black and yellow, hence the name Oreo. And uh, man, there's some really beautiful. As a matter of fact, this one is what they would call a Halloween, which is basically just like the Oreo, but the apricot version. So you have that that orangey, yellowy band in the middle and, uh, and kind of looks like a, a <laughs> look at these guys, like the bite right off the rip. It's so funny. And again, you, uh, you know, that's why they're called Halloween Pueblins, but they're pretty cool, you know? Let's see what we got here. Oh, check this out. This is awesome. This is actually a het scaleless corn snake clutch. And right here, you can see that is a scaleless corn snake. And again, that's a recessive mutation and I just absolutely love them. But what's cooler in this clutch is actually a couple of these guys. This is actually a creamsicle, het creamsicle clutch. And guess what? We got a couple creamsicle scaleless, but uh, you know, I've said this before, is that when scalas hatch out, they often get kind of grimy looking with the, the bedding gets kind of attached to them. So we always like to soak them in water to see how beautiful they are. So let me go get a bucket of water and we'll clean these guys up. You gotta see them. So I can't wait to see how beautiful these things are. The creamsicles really are not as common in the scaleless corn snakes. You see some albinos, but you don't see the creamsicles too much. And typically what I'll do is I'll just let these guys kind of swim around for a few seconds and it kind of cleans them up a little bit, gets all that vermiculite off them. And then we'll put them in a bucket aside because I don't want to put them back in the vermiculite. These guys just get to, need to get set up right away. No sense in making them dirty again, but you can kind of see as they clean up how gorgeous these things are. <sighs> And it's so weird, you know, people that see scale of snakes, you know, first off, they think they're a little bit freaky, which they are, to be totally honest with you. But when you touch them, it's really weird because you're used to that scalation on a, a normal snake. And these guys are just smooth. It's almost like the gecko skin or even like a piece of rubber or something like that. So it's pretty cool. And I'm always excited to be hatching these guys. Wow. These guys are gonna be beautiful when they get some size to them. Again, I'm just gonna set them this bucket over here. We'll get them set up right away. And we'll move on and show you guys what else we have here. Let's see. Oh gosh, it's, you know, I always get so excited when I'm hatching baby snakes for sure. 
Oh, look at this. It's only one little baby. There's only two eggs in the clutch, so only one of them hatch. But look at how gorgeous that is. That's a mandarin rat snake. And I've always said that the mandarin rat snakes, to me, when it comes to colubrids anyways, is probably one of the most beautiful of all of the colubrids that are naturally occurring. Wow. It's so cool. What's cool about mandarins is they typically have four to six eggs typically. They don't really double clutch, but they hatch really quick. Most colubrid eggs take about 60 to 65 days to hatch. These guys will hatch in about 40 to 45 days, so it's a really quick incubation. Man, that's awesome. Oh, I always love hatching these guys, and there's so much sentimental reason for it, too. These are, of course, albino Honduran milk snakes, and we were fortunate enough to bring the very first albino Honduran milk snakes into the country from a buddy of mine, Stefan, over at MS Reptilian over in Germany. And uh, I'll never forget the day that I actually picked up that shipment. It was just amazing to me, and uh, fortunately, we were able to hatch our very first albino Hondurans a couple years later. And it's just something that's always so special to me. As a matter of fact, I tell people a lot of times the albino Honduran milk snake was one of the most pivotal projects that I've ever worked on. Of course, later on the pinstripe and other projects were just as big, if not bigger, but this was really my first major project. So albino Honduran milk snakes are always really special to me. And let's take a look. Oh man, these are so gorgeous. Look at this. Whoop, whoop. You see that snake just take a jump out of there. Oh, come over here, little bugger. <laughs> Again, that's the problem with these snakes is once they start getting fired up, they go fast. But this is really cool. This is actually a T-positive albino Nelson's milk snake. Now, I've showed you albino Nelson's, and these are basically the exact same thing, but they're T-positive. But the interesting thing about it is it's allelic to the T-negatives, which are the normal you know, red and white and yellow animals, and the T-positive just has this beautiful purple look to it. Now, I remember when we got our first ones, we had no idea that they were allelic, meaning that if you breed this to an albino, half the babies come out T positive. Typically, T positive and T negative oftentimes are completely different genes. You have to breed them out completely differently. But in this case, they actually you know, are on the same allele and you can produce them right off the rip. And man, those things are gorgeous. And when they get bigger, they're even prettier. Oh, this is really cool. Now, this is actually a cool clutch to show you the polymorphism within things. You know, these are ghost cow kings and ghost cow kings are all over the place. You have animals like this, you have animals that look like this, and, and, and even animals that look like this, all from the same clutch that are all ghost cow kings, which is a recessive mutation, but you have a ton of polymorphism in them. And uh, it's just really cool to always hatch them out. And then of course we have the albinos that are really interesting looking as well and even the iridescent cow kings come from the ghost cow king line. So uh, just a really unusual gene. And this was actually found, believe it or not, on an airport grounds out in California, which I thought was pretty interesting. Gary Kiesler is the one that found them, bred them out, and of course, now they're around all over the place. But guys, I have my hands full because I've got to set all these babies up and it's just gonna keep coming every day until we're done hatching. This has been awesome sharing this experience with you. And as always, I'm Facebooking and tweeting my way through it. So make sure to follow me over at Snakebites TV or on Instagram at snakebites.tv. Until next week, you've been watching Snake Bites. Hi, I'm Peter Birch, an Aussie bloke who loves wildlife. My respect for nature started when I was a young boy in rural New South Wales. Since then, it's exploded into an obsession. New episodes every Thursday only on Animal Bites TV.